basketball draft is no longer just about selecting the best player to improve your club. It's also about it making sure your pick has the best looking mom of any NBA team at an NBA bloggers meeting. Hi everyone. This is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. This week, of course, is the 4th of July. So before I begin the show, I'd like to have a shout out to all Americans today on our birthday as a nation. And I hope that barbecue, remember why we're off today, why we are celebrating the 4th of July. Hope you get to a picnic or the parades, have a barbecue, a beer and a hamburger like I love to do. Listen to some of the ball games on either the radio or TV and just uh, end the day watching the fireworks. Anyway, being the 4th of July, and I, I do want to get into a couple of things, in, including the recent passing of uh, Marlon Briscoe, uh, the first African-American to start a football game in the AFL or the, yeah, the AFL as um, in its history. But uh of course, traditionally, July 4th is seen as, let's say, the crossroads in the baseball pennant race. This is where we really separate the wheat from the chafe. And it looks like, well, <laughs> the Cincinnati Reds, who I follow, their season was lost in April, going 3-18, and although they have played a little bit better lately. Still, it's not going to get them to the promised land called the playoffs. The Yankees, on the other hand, are in really good shape. I'll talk about... Uh, the Yankees and the Mets uh, later on uh, in, or in future episodes, only because I want to devote so much time to uh, other sports. But just this, Yankee fans are looking pretty good right now. One thing that has been overlooked really on this Yankee team, they have fantastic hitting. Their pitching has really stayed together, uh, really done a nice job, uh, really with uh, – just with injuries, but also just piecing together a nice pitching staff from really unknowns. Uh, but what's really been overlooked with the Yankees is their defense, which has been more than solid. I've watched numerous Yankee games, and they just have a different look to them, uh, a different presence on the field. And what I mean is it looks like they are just really – the defense has really come together. And uh, that was something I think that was missing the last two years. It seems like they are trying to fit players where they didn't really belong. This year, though, definitely solid. And that has really propelled them to this unbelievable start playing over better than 720 baseball. Here, here's the deal. They haven't made it to the halfway point, the 81 game. But think about it this way. They already have 50 wins, 50-plus 50 wins. Even over those last 80 games, if they only win 40, if they go 40 and 41, they're still at 90 wins for the year, which should push them into the playoff, into a playoff spot, at the very worst as a wild card team. So things are really looking good. Do I think they're going to play 500? No. Do I think they're going to play 720 baseball for the rest of the year? I got to think about that. Do I think they're going to probably win two thirds of the rest of their games? Right now, uh, I was looking, I think they're on their way to about 117 wins if everything works out. I will probably make a prediction and say the Yankees are going to win 109 to 110 games because I do. Uh, there are some really good teams uh, in the AL East. I, I I still haven't given up on Toronto. I, I think the Boston could give them some problems, and obviously Tampa Bay can as well. So <laughs> I'm taking you down, Yankee fans, by uh, eight games, but it's still going to give you 109, 110 for the season. Not too bad. Not too bad. And, of course, you know what you can do with my predictions. Remember, if I pick Michigan in football, take the other team. If I pick against Michigan, 
if I then bet on Michigan. All right. And I'm not a proponent for betting. I'm just saying I am not good at making those uh, predictions. Anyway, I, I want to put up a picture of Marlon Briscoe. Here's a card playing wide receiver for the Bills. And here he is as quarterback for the 68 Denver Broncos. Now, a little bit of history about Marlon Briscoe. And this is and this is a special shout out to Howard who did forward me the obituary and the story about Marlon Briscoe passing away. And I'm going to say it's about seven, 10 days ago. Uh, he died of pneumonia. I didn't realize this. I don't know why. I, I Sometimes you just mistake players for other players. I thought he went to a big time school like Michigan or Ohio State. I was wrong about that when I did some of my research. And this is why I love this show. First of all, there are no experts. I, I, I love doing the sports research. I guess I know a little bit more than maybe the average fan, but I certainly am not an expert in any way. In fact, I think what this show has done is humble me rather than uh, elevate me or uh, stroke my ego because I learn, I, I'm just so fascinated by sports history and I learn even more uh, as we go, even as I'm going to the taping of this show. Uh, this is a witness of it. The fact that Marlon Briscoe didn't realize the number of teams he played for and didn't realize that he was a uh, pretty good player. Pretty good player. I always thought he was much bigger. I always thought he was a tight end growing up watching. So I'm thinking he's 6'3", about 240. How wrong was I about that? He was about 5'11", 170. Anyway, make a long story short, he played at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. He didn't play for the Cornhuskers. They play in Lincoln. This is the University of Nebraska, Omaha. And I was like, wait a minute. I, I had to look this up because I know Nebraska, Omaha as a uh, hockey power in Division One. That's how I remember it. I, I see them every once in a while. I'll watch it. Uh, I'll watch the Frozen Four, one of the best uh, nicknames in college uh, sports from a marketing standpoint, the Frozen Four. And the, why I like it so much, it's kind of like lacrosse because they have these weird teams like St. Cloud State, uh, Michigan Tech, Northern Michigan, that are all big time hockey teams. Denver University, which is a power not just in hockey, but in lacrosse as well. Anyway, Briscoe went to the University of Nebraska, Omaha, which originally started out as a private school, was, uh, 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 um, a religious school, I think Presbyterian. Anyway, they shift to becoming a state run uh, institution. And they actually had a football team and Briscoe played on it and leads them to a 27 and 11 year uh, or total record while he was their starting quarterback. Goes to the AFL, plays with the Broncos and Lou Saban, who is one of these um, uh, journeyman coaches, obviously had a couple of good seasons. And I do think he leads a, a, a team to a championship, but I'm just going to pull up and I appreciate that you guys allow me to do this every once in a while. Um, in 68, and I'm just going to read this off, Saban is their coach. They go five and nine. He does. He's a two-time champion in the AFL. This is Lou Saban in 64 and 65 with the Buffalo Bills. He actually records, uh, he wins in those two years. He goes 22-5-1 and one and wins the AFL titles and then goes on to uh, Denver, where his first year, first year he goes three and eleven, and then the year that he has Briscoe, he goes five and nine. And Briscoe, let me put this up again because I do love those Denver uniforms. Anyway, um, it was a September game, and Saban has to go to uh, actually it was September 29th. Uh, he has to go to Marlon Briscoe as his backup, backup emergency quarterback, because his first two, one was spotty and the other was injured. And uh, the fellow who was injured, I'll just give this to you real quick, um, was Steve Tenzi, was the starter, and he suffers a broken collarbone. Joe DeVito was spotty. And now I'm just using the, uh, the words from Wikipedia on this. Uh, Saban now has to bring... Briscoe, and Briscoe completes a 22-yard pass, and then he engineers an 80-yard scoring drive. 
comes up short against the Boston Patriots and they lose by three. But then he starts later on and he will start on October 6th. And I just want to give you this. On October 6th, he leads them to a win over the Cincinnati Bengals. And in that game, Briscoe goes, I'm hoping I have it. He goes 15 for 30, excuse me. He goes 14 for 34, 125 yards, one interception, no touchdowns. And they win 10 to seven. Okay. He never gets really, uh, he had a couple more shots that year as the quarterback. And I think he finished his career with a record of um, like two and three. Anyway, he wants the quarterback again. And uh, they have other plans for Briscoe. They want him to continue as a wide receiver. He doesn't really want to do that. He goes on to Buffalo. Actually, he finished his quarterback record was two and three. Goes to Buffalo. Plays a couple of seasons there. Then goes to Miami. And he wins not one, but two championships. Plays wide receiver for the undefeated Miami Dolphins of 72. And, of course, the repeat team of 1973. Hangs on uh, and finishes his career, actually, in 1976. And this is what I learned, was he finishes his career with the New England Patriots. And if anybody who's a New England fan knows that they win uh, the division, go on, and uh, they lose to the Oakland Raiders in uh, first round of the playoffs. Actually, I don't know whether they were the playoff, uh, whether, whether they secured the first. Yeah, they were. They were AFC East champions. They were 11-3 and three under Chuck Fairbanks. I don't know why they were on the road. They did something. No, they were. they were. They were the wild card team that year. Baltimore finished in first place. They go on the road and lose a hard-fought game against the Oakland Raiders, who would go on, obviously, and win the Super Bowl in 1976. I just recall that game because I was rooting uh, vociferously for the uh, for the New England Patriots, and I always thought they got robbed in that game. And I was just seeing something on uh, one of the channels, and <laughs> – and Oakland had a late penalty called uh, in, in there for them, which kept their drive alive, their winning touchdown drive alive, and prevented from uh, the Bills uh, prevented the Patriots from upsetting them. Funny thing is, the Patriots during the regular season destroyed the uh, Raiders in the only game that the Raiders would lose that year. Anyway, Marlon Briscoe dead at the age of seventy nine, pneumonia but he is the first African-American player to start at quarterback in the AFL. All right, turning to, now that I've got the Yankees out of the way, oh, I did make a mistake when we were talking basketball a couple of weeks back, and I had mentioned that Michael Thompson, uh, saying that I always thought he could have had a greater career, and I misspoke when I, I think I said that he didn't win or play for any real great playoff teams. I was wrong. And I do make mistakes quite a bit on the show. Uh, but uh, I did look that up. Something that caught my attention about it. Make a long story short, he played for uh, the LA Lakers during the Magic Johnson era. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Jabbar, James Worthy, Michael Cooper, all the rest of it. And he won two titles. Really, when you think about it, even though he never got to the promised land, he goes there as a reserve player. And really, what a strong player coming off the bench for the Lakers and helps the Lakers secure two championships during their great run with uh, under, with Magic Johnson at, 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 at quarterbacking the team. Anyway, let us proceed now to the NBA draft. And this is just a shout-out. I do love the NBA draft. Uh, I was... And I'm a real I, – I think you know now. I'm kind of meat and potatoes. If I, I watch a football game, I don't want to be distracted. I don't need um, all these announcers telling me what's going on. You know that I like announcers that predict something that should happen rather than give, you know, uh, the narrative on what transpired. That being said, 
<laughs> I feel like I was watching the NBA draft this time around, and I only saw a few minutes of it. And I do like the NBA draft, but it seemed like every time I was going in, it felt like a reality show, and it is because it's live. I get all that, but I felt like it was more uh, watching the Oscars than it was an NBA draft. And I do take and pay particular attention to the NBA draft of all of them. First of all, I think the NBA or Major League Baseball and the NHL, as I'm thinking about this, the NHL is just as difficult. But those are probably the two toughest drafts to watch simply because there are so many players and there are so many leagues. And for college uh, and for baseball, you have college baseball and there's no way uh, unless you really are a scout or really are watching uh, the game <laughs> with, a, with a microscope, uh, you can't know all of these players. And so when they're drafted, you say, okay, great, great, great. With the NBA draft, it's a little bit different because most of the players, let's face it today, come from uh, Division One. They are, many are, of course, coming from European or, or team leagues and all the rest. Of it. Yes, I get all that. But for the most part, I think most NBA fans are very aware of many. I would say about, I'll even go as far as saying at least 70 75% of the players. Football, it's tough to deal with because, yes, we all know maybe the offensive players, the players with the numbers. And then you have the imaginary numbers, and, and it's not a slight against football. It's just that you have to come up with, like, artificial statistics for linemen. And not too many people know who the linemen are, even on their own team, because they are uh, – they're not – let's face it. You go as – your headline players are your offensive players, and occasionally your defensive players, like the Lawrence Taylors uh, or the Deion Sanders, that sort. OK, but for the most part, the NBA, it's a fun draft simply because, you know, all the players, you can see all the players and you see both their offense and defensive abilities on the court, either in March Madness or in conference tournaments or during the regular season, if you take in a game or two. And you are also aware there are so many games being played on the college level. You can see all these players from, let's say, Podunk, Podunk University or, you know, East of West State University. You've probably seen them play somewhere. So you're very aware of them. That being said, the last, this last NBA draft, I, I, I thought it was uh, like watching the Hollywood or the Oscars, hence the cartoon. Now, I got that little editorial out of the way. Let's get right to what I love, the history of the game itself. And the NBA draft has always, as I said, has always intrigued me. Here's what I, I found out was pretty wild about the NBA draft. The first three picks, and I'm only doing the draft picks, number one, and as many as I can do for as, as fun as I can. 1947 was the first NBA draft. And a fellow by the name of Clifton McNeely, uh, is selected by, ready for this, the Pittsburgh Ironmen. First of all, Pittsburgh Ironmen no longer exist. Secondly, the Pittsburgh Ironmen didn't exist after the draft, apparently, <laughs> after 1947. And for all of the scouting that the Pittsburgh Ironmen did on Clifton McNeely, guess what? McNeely never suited up in an NBA game. In fact, he went into private business rather than playing the NBA. Funny, and everyone might think that's kind of crazy, but you have to realize that the salaries that the NBA players or Major League Baseball players are getting today are not what they were getting years ago. Yeah, they were still, uh, in relation to, let's say, other occupations, uh, they were getting, I would say, pretty good pay. But there were also... Uh, they also knew that they could probably do better by starting into the uh, private practice, uh, getting their law degree and, and moving on, especially if they didn't uh, envision an NBA career. Well, Clifton McNeely didn't obviously envision an NBA career. He was a guard. I know he was a shooting guard because when I was reading about him, and this is why I say there's no sorts of experts. I didn't know that McNeely was the first pick until I started doing research. He was a real shoot first 
forget everything else on the court later kind of guy. And uh, he did score quite a bit in college playing at, ready, Texas Wesleyan. Now, Texas Wesleyan, uh, I don't know. I'm going to just look this up right now on Wikipedia if they have become some something else. They were, well, they still are a private Methodist school. They are still in existence today. The only reason I say that is that, you know, UTEP started as Texas Western and then becomes University of Texas El Paso. So I was wondering whether Texas Wesleyan became something else. They didn't. But they're not Division One. I. I don't even know if they have a club team. Well, they probably have a club team, but they're not playing big time. And Clifton McNeely is selected out of this very tiny Texas college and never plays. And, of course, unfortunately has a reputation of, man, you give it to him, he's shooting it, and forget everything else, okay? Now, the next two, I don't have any pictures for it, so you're going to have to look at me uh, or you <laughs> look away. Uh, the Providence Steamrollers, another team that doesn't exist. In fact, I am sure they shared. I'm pretty sure the NFL had a team called the Providence Steamrollers. And before I say I'm absolutely sure, I'm going to say I'm pretty sure about that because I try not to make too many mistakes. But not only did Providence, like Pittsburgh, not share uh, or not have a team anymore, but uh, they're, they got actually two number one picks. Oh, just uh, I wanted to tell you this as I was thinking about this. The Pittsburgh Ironmen were the worst team apparently statistically ever measured by one of the metrics that does all the basketball history, even topping the 1972-73 Philadelphia 76ers that won nine games and had 73 losses and had a guy on the team by the name of Steve Mix from the University of Toledo. I don't know why I remember that team, but I, I do remember, I think they had – Oh, well, now, of course, some of the names escape me. I used to be able to remember all those guys that were on that 76 or team. Uh, but the steamrollers who no longer exist. But anyway, the Ironmen were so terrible. They don't even have, like I said, a team the following year. They just, uh, the franchise just bellies up and they no longer exist. The steamrollers of Providence, they got back-to-back -back picks. They selected Andy Tonkovich and Howie Shannon. Then I'm going to say this. This is the very first time, and I know that people are probably saying, all right, like, let's get to the – you talk about meat and potatoes. Let's get to the teams that really count, and that's the Lakers and the Celtics. Well, here is the very first Celtic number one draft pick. His name is Charlie Cher. Went to Bowling Green. He was a center – Averaged 3.9 points in his NBA career. And as you can see by the card, he winds up with the St. Louis Hawks. Uh, I don't think he played for the glory teams of the Celtics, but I'm just going to make sure as I say that uh, he played for – never does he play for um, the Boston Celtics. In fact – Cher was drafted by the Celts, I'm taking this off Wikipedia, whose fans wanted the team to draft local Holy Cross star Bob Cousy. So Red Orbach, who's the new coach, defended the unpopular pick, saying, we need a big man, little men are a dime a dozen. I'm supposed to win, not go after local yokels. In, any, in an irony, Hall of Fame Cousy ended up being drafted by the Tri-City Blackhawks, who become the Atlanta Hawks. Cousy then balked at playing in Moline, Illinois, and eventually his rights were sold to the Chicago Stags. The Stags then folded before the season, and the Celtics chose Cousy in the dispersal draft. How wild is that? And that's something I just learned as I'm reading it to you. I'm glad I did look up about this. Now, the reason I will tell you this also, I think there was some regional picking that was going on in the NBA. I know there was for a number of years, uh, and you'll see this coming to fruition when I, I talk about the uh, the Royals franchise. But uh, it used to be that there were certain, let's say, institutions that were reserved for certain teams because they were in the region, and they thought it would interest, obviously, the fan base, which Cousy from Holy Cross would interest the Boston Celtic fan base. 
And I would say that that little bit of luck, even though Orbach, who's seen as a genius, see, see what I mean about experts? And you guys know how I decry the use of experts. I'm no expert. I do know a little bit about sports. Notice I emphasize a little bit about sports. But what I do love about it is just researching it. Orbach, obviously, lucked out by getting koozie. Uh, the first time he let it go, hey, guards are a dime a dozen. And then I think <laughs> Lady Luck and Divine Intervention brought Kuzi, Orbach, and the Celtics together. So that is Charlie or Chuck Scher, who is the uh, first pick of the Boston Celtics. Now, I got to get to a guy, and I try to keep this, I guess, the show squeaky clean in a certain respect. Um but I do want to bring up a guy who is selected with the first pick, and that is uh, Gene Melchior. Now, the reason why I want to bring up Gene Melchior, interestingly enough, he was a guard from Bradley University. Bradley has pretty interesting basketball history. First of all, people don't realize this. In 1950, they make the NCAA tournament. They also make the NIT tournament. In 1950, they make the championship of the NIT and the NCAA tournament. In both cases, they lost to the same team, CCNY. And both of those teams would somehow be involved in the reason that Gene Melchior would never play in the NBA. And that was, unfortunately, the betting scandals or the gambling, you know, the... Uh, betting scandals of uh, college basketball, where they were unfortunately um, not so much throwing games as much as uh, making sure that the point spread worked in favor of certain people. Melchior, of course, got involved in some of the point shaving and, um, and was never allowed to play in the NBA. Uh, here's one of those cartoons that I do love. Um, love it because this was, you know, in a lot of ways, this was uh, my inspiration for wanting to draw sports cartoons and all the rest of it. Now, these are not what I do. Obviously, I, I like to do a little more editorial in nature, but I have done these types where you have the actual illustration of the player and then little cartoons on the side, blurbs about, ah, you know, Joe led the team in scoring or Hal led the team with home runs in 1963 or 23 or something like that. But these used to appear either in magazines or newspapers, etc. And this one is on Squeaky Gene Melchior of the Bradley Braves. And don't the cartoons, they're reminiscent of, and that's the other thing I like, they're reminiscent of uh, the tops on the backs of Topps basketball cards, which is what I'm going to show you next uh, with a couple of my cards. All right. Do want to show you this. All right. I'm getting close. I'm getting close. Mark Workman. And the reason why I'm bringing him up is that he's selected by the Milwaukee Hawks. Mark Workman. And... He is the first of three West Virginia players that were selected in the draft. And the reason why I say this is that, uh, of course, Mo uh, the Milwaukee Hawks become the Atlanta Hawks uh, in their history. Workman, of course, is in the West Virginia Mountaineer Hall of Fame. The reason I bring this up is that when I was going through this, ready? You have Andy Tonkovich went to Marshall. Then Charlie Scher, I didn't mention this before, he went to Bowling Green. Now you have Mark Workman, West Virginia. You are going to see in two more drafts where back-to-back -back Duquesne players are selected, then a West Virginia player. So you have six players among the first ten that are basically from the same area. And I don't know why that is. I have some theories of my own about that probably regionalization, regional picks, number one. Number two is I'm wondering whether the scouts ever ventured any farther west of the Mississippi. That's number two. Number three is 
maybe these players are getting an inordinate amount of publicity because maybe they are playing in the garden. I have to check on that. Or they're in the NCAA tournament. I have to check on that. Or in what was a big time thing event then was the NIT. And why I say separate the NIT is that uh, Madison Square Garden was hosting college double headers and were bringing in teams from all over uh, the United States to play. And of course, the NIT, of course, would bring all the teams together and play uh, over the course of a week, maybe 10 days in a tournament. But Mark Workman was the first player selected from West Virginia. Unfortunately, he passed away at a very young age in uh, Florida, uh, I think age 53. So, um, and of course, those are the blue and yellow. Those are the colors of West Virginia. I love their logo, by the way, the W and a V. It, it's great looking on the helmet. They shouldn't do anything. And this is another editorial. I wish they would just leave their helmet alone and just leave it. I don't mind it with the gold. Sometimes they have the gold background when they have a different helmet, paint the W and the V. Anyway, the very first two players that are what they consider all-stars are Ray Felix and Frank Selvey, and they are selected in back-to-back -back years, 53 and 54, by the Baltimore Bullets, who are today, of course, the Washington Wizards. I do know this. Ray Felix, I believe, goes on and plays for the Lakers. This is just me doing some research earlier in the week. And Frank Selvey, I do remember this, but I did get, went to Furman, and I think uh, – he is one of the first or one of the few players to score 100 points in a college game. Now, reason why I don't have any pictures for them, so I'm not passing over them, but I, I think most, most big college basketball fans are familiar with Frank Selby. The next guy, though, is by the name of Dick Ricketts. reason I bring him up, Ricketts went to Duquesne, and this is what I was talking about. Before, he went to Duquesne along with, I don't know if they're exactly teammates. Uh, I am sure, though, they had to run uh, on the same team or were teammates at some point. But I'm going to pronounce this wrong. But So Hugo Green was a guard forward like Dick Ricketts, played for Duquesne, 1954-55. Uh, he is selected, of course, by the Rochester Royals. Now, the reason I bring these two guys up, they're both from uh, Duquesne. And as I mentioned, Western Pennsylvania, Duquesne, in Pittsburgh or on the outskirts of the metro, uh, of the Pittsburgh city lines. Uh, then you have the West Virginia guy, Mark Workman. Uh, Andy Tonkovich goes to Marshall. And of course, you have Charlie Shear going to Bowling Green. Kind of like that area. West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, etc. I, I, and I think it's the regionalization and just the fact that, uh, I, I don't know, maybe they just had great marketing. It, it's really, when I think about it now, um, you're so used to seeing players coming from big time schools today. Kansas, uh, North Carolina, Duke, uh, UCLA, Michigan, that this was kind of, to me, uh, it, it just stood out. All right. So, so Hugo Green is selected, of course, by the Rochester Royals, who would come the Cincinnati Royals. And I would be remiss if I didn't put their logo up there. One of uh, the coolest logos, at least for the NBA. The NBA, let's face it, has the worst logos today. Everything is just a basketball with the name of the team. This one, of course, I learned this from my brother, Jim. Shout out to him. Uh, Cincinnati's nickname was called the Queen City. And um, so probably the crown. <laughs> I know they never, in all my time, uh, Rochester did win one championship. Maybe that's why they have the crown up there. But they move out of Rochester and go to Cincinnati. Now, I do know this. Cincinnati, here's the wildest thing, or the Royals franchise. They get not one, not two, not three, but four first-round draft picks in the first five years. Now, I don't know whether it's because they were a lousy team. Again, I'd like to really look that up or how they arranged it. Uh, but ready for this, the Rochester, now Cincinnati Royals, 
Uh, they had already selected Green from Rochester. They move in 57. And their next pick is a guy by the name of Hot Rod Hunley. Kind of an interesting guy. He is from West Virginia. And the funny thing about Hunley, I am very familiar with Hunley, but not as a player. Uh, he does play for the Lakers, obviously. I remember him more as a color analyst for the NBA games. He didn't really make a mark with the Utah Jazz, but I remember for a while growing up watching the games, he would do, I'm pretty sure, some college games as uh, for what they used to call TVS. People out there, I don't know. It's on Channel 4, but TVS was the syndicated uh, broadcaster of college basketball. And they would show both regional games. I always remember Fordham being on TV, but then they would also do a national game. Uh, but, you know, Kirk Gowdy would do the game. And I, I seem to recall that Hunley would do color analysts. And he was funny. He was funny. You wouldn't learn the ins and outs of, of like, uh, of the game like John Madden taught you when you watch football. But he was just funny, had some great stories. He was just a bubbly personality, really good for the game of basketball. The shame is, and I think it, it was his uh, choice, was that really Utah latched on to him. And I, I don't know whether he was just tired of the national scene, but when you did get to see the U Utah game or listen to him, he was funny. He was funny. All right, next guy. Um, Funny thing also about Hot Rod Hunley, and I didn't realize this, you know, growing up he had, uh, I don't think his parents were always around. And from an article I read about him, he actually lived with teammates, I think, during the season. But most of the time he led uh, as a 15, 16, and 17-year-old. He lived independently, lived by himself. Pretty remarkable. One, to graduate, play basketball, and then – to go on and graduate and play at a uh, big time level. Of course, going to West Virginia, hometown school in his hometown state. So interesting about Hot Rod Hunley. He came really from, let's say, um, an interesting situation and really made something of, of his life and really has been a great contributor to the great game of basketball. All right, next guy. After Hunley... You have Elgin Baylor. Now, this is a great trivia question. I've done, uh, I've talked about Elgin Baylor before, but just remember this: Elgin Baylor is actually the first number one pick to make the Hall of Fame. So that's really a good trivia question. And the funny thing is, Bob Boozer was a good player, uh, and he is sandwiched between three Hall of Fame players: Elgin Baylor, Oscar Robertson, and Walt Bellamy. And Oscar Robertson is, of course, the last of the four uh, Royals players selected. All right, University of Cincinnati. Bob Boozer, I'm going to get you his Cincinnati one, was a really good player. One of those guys that added to your team. Um, here's the thing. He probably could have been maybe uh, – maybe a few more points here and there on his scoring average. You might be calling a, a cusp Hall of Famer, but he does win a championship. The reason I bring this in, I didn't have this particular one, but I remember the NBA cards had these posters and you took it out and it unfolded. And of course it was a measuring stick to determine your height as compared to the NBA players. These might, if you can find them are probably worth more than pristine basketball cards from the same year, simply because there were fewer of them and they're harder to come by. Bob Boozer, interestingly enough, was on the 1960 uh, Olympic team that played in Rome. And ready for this, this is what I loved about it, was that Boozer was on, uh, ready for this team, they win the, end, uh, the gold medal. And Boozer does win, and I apologize for this, Boozer does win uh, an NBA championship with the 70-71 Milwaukee Bucks played alongside Oscar Robertson, who happens to be his teammate on the gold uh, medal winning basketball team in Rome for the United States. On that team, ready for this? These are some of the players now. Some of them I'm familiar with. Some I did see play. 
uh, and others I'm unfam- I have no clue who they are. Jay Arnett, I'm just going to give a list of those 1960 gold medal winners. Jay Arnett, Walt Bellany, Hall of Famer, Bob Boozer, really good player, Terry Dissinger. I don't remember seeing him play, but I heard about him. Burdett, Halderson, Daryl Imhoff, did hear about him, didn't see him play. Alan Kelly, Lester Lane, this guy everybody should know. Jerry Lucas, not only wins, he's one of those guys, wins an NBA championship, an NCAA title, and a gold medal. Magic Johnson does the same thing. Bill Russell does the same thing. There's not too many of those guys with that trifecta. Oscar Robertson, of course. Adrian Smith and Jerry West. Can you imagine a backcourt of West and Robertson? Of course, Jerry West, of course, is a West Virginia alum, just like Hot Rod Hundley and Mark Workman. All right. I know I, but Bob Boozer does play on the 7071 Bucks, led by uh, Larry Costello, who was their coach and first coach in Bucks history. That team was loaded. They had Oscar Robertson, who they traded for, John McLaughlin in the backcourt, good player. They had Bobby Dandridge, who would be later traded on to the Washington Bullets and capture another title with them. And, of course, in the middle, they had Lou Alcindor, a.k.a. Um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and another player from UCLA on that team, Lucius Allen. Last guy I just want to talk about is Dick Ricketts, because like Dave DeBusher and Deion Sanders and even Bo Jackson, he was a guy that played two professional sports. Uh, unlike Dave DeBusher and Bo Jackson and Deion Sanders, he didn't play them at the same time. In fact, Dick Ricketts played uh, as a pitcher, but don't confuse him with Dave Ricketts. I don't know whether they were teammates per se on the Cardinal teams. I think they just miss each other uh, by a few years. But Dave Ricketts was a catcher. Dick Ricketts was a pitcher. Funny thing about Dick Ricketts was the fact that um, he plays base. Uh, he plays basketball. He goes to ready for this. Dick Ricketts goes to um, Duquesne. He retires from basketball and only plays one season of baseball. And the last guy I want to just mention, shout out, Billy McGill. Had to mention him, who is the first number one NBA draft pick to play in the ABA. He played with the Utah Stars. I do remember that. This one, uh, he played not only with Utah, but with the Denver Rockets, the L.A. Stars, the Pittsburgh Pirate Pipers, and the Dallas Chaparrales. Billy McGill was a good player. He went to the University of Utah, and he was the number one pick in 1962. Hey, this is Willow Tool wishing you all again a happy 4th, and thank you for joining me. See you next week with another episode of Park Ridge Sports History. Another shout-out to Howard Fredericks, my great producer. Thank you.